All right, welcome. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Faber. I'm director of the Northeastern Environmental Justice Research Collaborative. I'm also coordinator of the New England Environmental Justice Research Network. So welcome to our uh, discussion today around environmental justice. It's a very exciting time to doing EJ work in New England, as we'll be hearing from our panelists today. Uh, there's been a lot of important accomplishments. Even though there's a lot of work to be done, we've uh, had some celebrations of late, including last night, of which some of you were there and partook in the festivities. And hopefully the jackhammer will stay low tonight, because I have a little bit of a headache less from, the, uh, from the wine from last night. <coughs> So I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, each one of uh, the groups will go for roughly 20 minutes and we'll hold the questions for at the end of the session. But I'd like to start off with the Environmental Justice League of Rhode Island. I'd like to introduce Jennifer Rossi who joined the Environmental Justice League um, as development director just in this last February in 2015. Jen has worked with the Rhode Island nonprofit sector for the past 15 years and speci specifically was focused on youth development, community collaboration, grants management, and strategic planning. She is interested in bridging the gaps between environmental, gender, and reproductive justice and is excited to bring this lens to the Environmental Justice League of Rhode Island. I'd also like to introduce Steve Roberts, who just joined the Environmental Justice League of Rhode Island as the organizing director in February of 2015. Um, he attended Rhode Island College and he graduated just recently in 2014, congratulations, with a bachelor's in communication. And his first organizing experience came from organizing a national moment of silence rally in Providence around uh, issues of police brutality and state sanctioned violence. And Steve's social justice concentration includes anti-criminalization, food justice, and the right to public space. And Finally, I'd like to introduce he Jesus Holquin. Um, Jesus has been involved with the EJ League uh, since he was a sophomore in high school, about six years ago. Uh, he was a youth organizer at the EJ League, where he created a youth program called Echo Youth, and is now in his fourth year of running that program. Because of his passion for justice, he was selected to attend the national as a National Youth Organizer Training Institute with Seoul in California. He's also a member of a coalition called Right to the City. Recently, he was selected to be part of a national group called Beyond the November Movement, also known as Black Youth Project 100. His main areas of activism are grounded around issues of environmental and food justice, LGBT rights, and immigration. So welcome, uh, representatives from the Environmental Justice League of Rhode Island. Hello, and I guess, are we afternoon? Almost afternoon, so I'll say good afternoon. Um, so as you just heard, the three staff members here from EJ League are all really new. Um, we all started in February, so it was a very interesting experience to actually put together this presentation um, because it allowed us to kind of take a look into some of our history um, and learn from people that have been involved um, with the organization from quite some, for quite some time. So that said, we're going to do our best to kind of talk about um, what collaboration has looked like in the past, um, but also want to focus on um, what it looks like presently and kind of where we see the organization going um, and our collaborative efforts, you know, as they stand. And hopefully I can work this technology because... Yes, okay. So um, just to start, you know, basically for anyone who's not familiar with the EJ League, um, we, we're a nonprofit organization led by Rhode Island residents um, who care deeply about the neighborhoods in Rhode Island and, and I think very specifically Providence. Um, we focus on um, health, uh, we focus on food justice, we focus on um, access to public space, and as we go through the presentation, we'll speak more specifically about kind of what those programs look like. So, in the beginning, um, and this is where, you know, it's kind of interesting to go back and, and really see how the organization was formed, and I think what we learned was that, um, the EJ League was really fortunate, and I think some of this might have to do with the small geography um, of Providence and Rhode Island, but um, basically it really was collaboration that catalyzed this organization. Um, from the very beginning, um, you know, there was a, a specific campaign, a lot of base building that was happening around um, the uh, siting of a public school on contaminated land. 
Um, and eventually, that formed the Providence Environmental Justice Forum, um, which held its first statewide conference in 2007. Um, and then that eventually merged into what we now have as a, a formal nonprofit. Um, during those couple years of kind of base building um, and collaboration, um, academia was a, a played a big role um, in that, and Brown University in particular. Um, Eventually, Brown uh, was awarded um, with a Superfund grant, um, and the EJ League became a formal part of their community outreach um, core with a couple other organizations. Um, but from the beginning, kind of the Brown's presence was was there um, and was really a part of kind of how the EJ League came came to be. And my our friend Phil Brown is right in front, who is. Who is there? And I've, I've said, Phil, if I say anything that's incorrect or we miss something big, just like raise your hand. Um, so just pointing that out again. Okay. Um, all right. And there's a lovely picture of some of the people that were involved during those initial years. Okay. So when Brown University got the Superfund, um, uh, received the Superfund grant, there were a few kind of uh, core projects that came out of that. Um, and as we go along, Jesus in particular is going to talk about how um, the university was involved in, in the actual implementation of programs. So it, our relationship with Brown in particular has not just been, you know, they have this grant and we get some of the money and they list us on a sheet that says we're part of the outreach pro, uh, uh, you know, outreach core. It really has been pretty hands-on. Um, so there were four, there were four just kind of, like I said, core um, collaborative projects that uh, came out of this, this Superfund program. And just briefly, I can tell you about a few of them. Um, the penalties bill um, is definitely a success story, and it raised fines from uh, $1,000 a day to $25,000 a day for companies that failed to obey uh, Department of Environmental Management notice of violation. Um, the EJ seminar students researched possible legislative and administrative solutions. So at that point, I think it was there was there was a cool connection between kind of people that were on the ground doing a lot of work and the need for capacity around research um, and kind of backing up um, what our legislative platform was around the issue. Um, the CARE Alliance was another example of a collaborative effort um, that came from the Superfund program. Um, the Community Outreach Corps, uh, which again, the EJ League is one of three, three um, partners in the Community Outreach Corps, played a major role in writing this $100,000 proposal to the EPA. Um, called a, It was a CARE grant. And basically what it allowed us to do was to bring really a diverse array of stakeholders to the table um, to identify sources of toxic pollution and environmental hazards in Providence. And there was a report that was issued um, at the end of all that on what the main um, sources and kind of environmental issues were. Um, I think this was really, from what I know of it, this was really kind of a venture that brought together like the private and public sectors in a way um, that you don't always see. Um, and that grant was, was used to build stronger relationships between advocacy groups, the Department of Health, um, who also had interest in some of the same data that we were collecting. Um, the Healthy Corner Store Initiative was um, another program that we worked in particular with Brown on. Um, it was basically a project to provide greater access to healthy food in like corner stores and local small uh, grocery and convenience stores. Um, we worked closely with students to help kind of with planning and also the creation of promotional materials. Um, and again, some of the funding was coming from the, the Superfund grant. And finally, the Community Environmental College, which we still are doing to this day, and it's kind of one of our, um, it really is kind of, you know, one of our main uh, programs. Um, it's an eight-week free summer program to Providence area residents of all ages. Well, really, it's like 13 to 19-year-olds. Um, but it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's a program that focuses on kind of food justice, um, the connections between different civil rights movements over time and, and what that means for the environmental justice movement today. Um, 
Brown students have helped to build, actually build that curriculum um, and have served as teaching staff in the past. And the Superfund uh, program continues to support this effort. Um, it's really cool because there's, there's graduate students that will come back the next year um, and teach. So it's not just kind of a pop in and pop out program. It really is about cultivating youth leadership um, over multiple years. Um, and we foster kind of additional collaboration through the program by having those students um, uh, do internships in the community. Um, so Jesus will talk more about that, that after. So these were the four, like I said, kind of um, real success stories that came out of this initial collaborative effort that brought the EJ League um, into fruition. And a lot of it had to do with the Superfund program at Brown. Um, and I think just in general, too, even now, we're, we're really trying to think... Um, we're continuing to try to think about how, especially in a place like Providence that's so small, how do we um, ex expand our network when it comes to academia um, in particular? So like right now, I mean, we have one of our board members is at UMass Dartmouth, and um, we were recently awarded a, um, a grant through the Department of Health for some health equity work, and she, even though she teaches um, you know, criminalization and uh, kind of she does a lot of social justice work um, as her profession. She went and taught a um, a seminar at the the conference. So there's, I think, a lot of connections that the EJ League can make, um, and we're trying to to widen that network as we go. So. Okay, so Jesus is going to kind of talk a little bit more specifically about kind of what we're doing now and. Hi, you guys. Um, again, hey, Suze. Um, so, yeah, that was awesome, Jen. Um, so, I'll tell you how the Healthy Corner Store, like, developed and, like, what it turned into after, like, trial and ever with, uh, like, everything we do. Um, so, the Healthy Corner Store, like Jen said, it started off, like, looking at food deserts and, like, where are the food deserts and talking about why there are food deserts. Um, and so we went, we would go into like different corner stores and like different bodegas and do like audits of like, what do you see when you first walk into the door and it's like cigarettes and like chocolate and chips. And we talked about how like that can also like frame someone who goes into a store just to see if they want something that can frame what they come out the store with. Um, so going into the stores, we got to work with a couple of stores that we're like, yeah, sure, we'll be part of this, like, we'll be able to, like, renovate the store and, like, move things around and see how it um, works. At first, it was really cool because we would go into stores and we would see that, like, their produce um, aisle was not really well taken care of. It was, like, stuff was just thrown there. Everything was bruised. Nothing really looked like I wanted to buy it, like, um, so, yeah. So, we, when we would go into the stores, we would go into the stores and we would rearrange the stores and we would, like, fix up their, like, produce or, like, really like hide all the <laughs> all the unhealthy stuff there was like a stack of like cereal to like the ceiling um we did that just so that no one would be tempted to take a box so that it doesn't <laughs> fall uh, <laughs> um so but through that we ended up like letting it go for a while and like let it see how how it works out within the stores and within the store owners a lot of times we would go back to the store and a lot of the stuff would be put back to where it was and a lot of it was just because staff didn't really know or like the communication wasn't completely there and also they said that sales dropped a little bit which was kind of the point but um also you have to make sure that the store owners are sustainable and able to sustain their stores uh, we ended up trying to get some like legislative work on, on like getting folks, store owners to um, get a like reduced um, value on um, refrigerators and freezers for their produce, um, so that they can carry more produce. Because I didn't know that's something that was like a big issue around their produce and the way it was. So. After that, we ended up working with the schools around the stores because we noticed that, like, after school, like, all the stores that were next to the schools would get, like, swamped with, like, kids because they want their snacks and whatever. A lot of them don't like the school lunch, and so they're like, I got to go get a bag of chips because I'm hungry. We would work with a lot of the stores. Um, well, we would go into those schools, and then we'll start. That's when, like, our, like, Swag Snacks, like, campaign came on to play because swag was, like, the word of the time at the time. Um, <laughs> and so it's, like, swag, swag Snacks is something that's good for you and makes you look cool, makes you look good. Um, this is us giving workshops at different schools talking about healthy food and, like, um, how it affects you and how to, like, really lead, read the labels of things and 
and how that connects to the stores. And we'll tell them, like, we've, we've been working with the store that's next to your school. Check it out. There's some swag snacks in there. Um, that was it for, like, the... Um, and actually, the Healthy Corner Store Initiative was, like, the, like, intro into, like, food justice work that we got into. And, like, we're continuing that. And, like, Steve will talk about that later, how we're continuing it. So back to the um, Community Environmental College. I actually first started off as a student for the Environmental College. Um, and then from then on, it, like, I got sucked into like, the EJ world. <laughs> um, so like Jen said, it's an it's a eight-week program. Um, we meet three days a week on three different classes. We have Food Justice, Environmental Justice, and Revolution 101. Um, within Food Justice, we focus on food deserts, GMOs, um, fast food restaurants, and we also talk about like how how like basically wherever you go, no matter like which urban neighborhood you're in, it's a fast food restaurant, a bodega, and a liquor store. And like we like did a lot of like why is that systemic and why does that happen? I think this was the class two years ago. We got like about. 30 to 40 students, and then we also take back in um, 10 graduate students who then go off and, I should have told you more about the different, the different classes, um, but they still go on and they apply what they've learned and do it at whatever partner organizations that we have. So I told you about food justice or environmental justice. We talk about how your zip code can be the biggest predictor to your overall health and what are the connections to that and to like the food that's around us and like where we live and talking about like airborne toxins in and outside your house. We also, within the Revolutionary 101 classes, like basics into like systems of oppression and we take them through like each system of oppression, like classism, sexism, um, heterosexism, racism, and we like basically break it down to them so that they can see the connections between um, EJ and racism and food justice and racism and food justice and environmental justice and basically make those connections for them just so that they understand um, what's how, how things are happening. And a lot of the times, these are kids that come from that neighborhood and they don't really see it because in their day-to-day -day life, they're taught to like, you know, make the best of what you have and like it's more of like realize what, what they're giving you. Um, so out of CEC, um, the the summer that the summer that I did CEC out of CEC, we would just go back to like our everyday life, and then next summer we'll see each other again. I'll like I'll get to like step up from being a student to being a teacher assistant, and then from being a teacher assistant to being a grad student or or even being a teacher. Um, but I didn't like that whole like break. It's like we just learned all this awesome stuff in the summer. Like what are we gonna do about it? Um, and so that's where Eco Youth came out of. Eco Youth is um, environmental community organizers. Um, it, yeah, it stands for environmental community organizers. It's a grassroots youth-led program. We um, fight. Uh, we fight against all types of inequality, from racism to classism, from the toxins in the, in, in the environment to our health problems within our community. We promote healthy lifestyles that everyone can access from. Um, we do a lot of workshops around asthma, air pollution, climate change, alternative energy, and food justice. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Th these are different pictures from us at like the climate march last summer. This is us doing like presentations, and this is just like a regular eco youth meeting um, a little while ago. Um, so off of um, eco youth, we have Green Drive. A couple of yous got. A couple of yous got to ride the bus yesterday. Um, it's an airport shuttle bus that we've um, made it run on veg uh, converted to run on vegetable oil. We teach that, and it's a multimedia learning lab where we can get on the bus and we can actually teach right on the bus and project our workshops on the bus. And these are we also use it as a community resource. Um, this is when it was being used as a um, mobile like farmers market type thing, where we would go to different parks and we can we'll hand out um, healthy foods to kids at the park. This is like where we use it as a fundraiser. We did like a bus pull where people had to pull the bus and different teams had to creatively come together and do it. Um, other play, other ways that we use the bus. This was um, Prism, uh, sister organization of ours. They used the bus um, in the Pride Parade in Rhode Island, and they like marched with it. Um, us handing out the snacks, and just happy kids. <laughs> um, and from here on, I'll give it to Steve so that he can tell you what we're looking forward to doing in the future. Hi, um, I'm Steve once again. Um, part of the reason uh, 
Jesus, Jen, and I got hired was the organization wanted to kind of become more grassroots and uh, be made of other people they were trying to help. Like Jesus grew up in uh, one of the one of the neighborhoods we we're, we're looking to work in. We work in. Oops. So our one of the major projects we have going forward now is creating health equity zones. Um, the Rhode Island Department of Health basically gave us uh, grant money to go out and um, go out and fix health dis health disparities and uh, spe specifically highlighted communities. And they gave us uh, a set of indicators within these communities that we can address, which will help correct these problems. Uh, for example, I think public trans is public transportation one. It's one of them, yeah. Uh, so, for example, public transportation is one, and public transportation uh, is more concentrated in working class areas because a lot of the people rely on it, and that at least increased pollution, which can affect asthma rates, so on and so forth. Um, and we're also we're the only social justice organization that got this. That's a part of this. The rest are like. Uh, Healthcare professionals, researchers. So we we're, we've been presented with a unique opportunity to correct some problems in our neighborhood. Uh, threshold is basically uh, it, it's funding for nonprofits uh, and connecting us with other folks who want to do the work. Uh, Guerrilla gardening is a project we're looking uh, looking forward to. Uh, it's basically kind of rights to the land, taking back the land, making it useful. Uh, this is one, this is a lot, before, but I didn't do it when I say we, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we be, uh, the organization basically, uh, some folks we partnered with reached out, reach out to us. We turned this lot over for um, community use. Um, and these are some of the coalitions we've, we've uh, become a part of. The GGJ Grassroot Global Justice is a coalition of like-minded grassroots organizations, and it's specifically focused on women's rights, like reproductive justice, um, and right to the city is... The one from the Lot that we took over. Oh, yeah, so the lot, the lot we were a part of, not me personally, <laughs> was, was uh, because some folks from right to the city, okay, got in contact with us. Uh, and these are just some pictures from when they went to the People's Climate March. Um, and one thing I will say that uh, the connection with academia is very important, but also know that uh, when you come out into these communities, you're operating from a position of privilege because the name, the what, what am I trying to say? The connotations that your that your institutions have are, you know, because of white supremacy, because of capitalism, because of classism, and so you want to you want to try to interact with these people in a way that doesn't use them only as capital, but actually genuinely includes their inputs, their concerns, and their ideas um, in a way that's, you know, self-sustaining. Uh, you know, these big, these big institutions take, take the money out of these programs, you know, would they, will they be self-sustaining? Can they be self-sustaining? And also, you want to get creative um, because relying on you know people who have more money than you to help fund your programs when it, and these programs are looking to dismantle systems that operate in the same way it's kind of um catch 22 yeah it's a catch 22 um so that's basically it. and this is our contact information in case you wanted to get in contact with us um and that's it thank you
right, thank you very much. All right, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Stacy Rubin, who's a senior attorney with Alternatives for Community Environment, which is uh, located right over here in Roxbury, one of the premier environmental justice organizations in the state. She represents and advises more than 30 client groups through court and administrative litigation, legislative drafting, transactional work, and regulatory matters. Stacy convenes the Massachusetts Environmental Justice Alliance and was the primary negotiator of the Massachusetts Executive Order on Environmental Justice. She wears many, many, many hats, uh, so in many ways the superwoman of the environmental justice movement in Massachusetts. I swear to God, I can see her leap buildings in a single bound in some days. Um, she does manage the, also the Massachusetts Environmental Justice Assistance Network and is responsible for maintaining relationships with attorneys, scientists, academics, and technical professionals accepting pro bono cases and recruiting new professionals to join the network and accept the cases. I should also mention that Stacy has a background in um, environmental health. She got her master's degree at Tufts uh, in public health where she examined the connections between uh, benzene exposure, cancer outcomes, and the legal challenges inherent in toxic tort litigation. Please welcome Stacy Rubin. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to just extend my sincerest appreciation to those of you who came out to our Jammin' for Justice event last night. It was um, a really fun time, so thank you so much for your support, for celebrating with us, and for those of you who missed it, I'm sorry, because it was awesome, and we had a really good time. And uh, most of the folks at ACE are probably just waking up right now, so I'm kind of the uh, one of the few ACE representatives here, although we have Lauren from the board and many supporters in the room. So. I wanted to talk about ways that ACE has worked in partnership with uh, environmental health researchers. So um, we as ACE are a nonprofit environmental justice organization and uh, even if, if there is the full lunch break you could even take a 20 minute walk down the street and kind of see our home neighborhood of Roxbury where we've been since our founding about 22 years ago. So we've got uh, multiple programs. I come from the legal services program and our mission and our reason for being is to add resources to community-based campaigns for environmental justice. And we are trying to bring together attorneys, technical professionals, as many resources as possible to the people who are directly impacted by environmental injustices and all the things that you just heard about from the EJ League of Rhode Island. We have our Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project, which is our youth program. And um, there's actually a, a really nice history of the REAP Youth partnering with Eco Youth in Rhode Island, as well as other organizations around New England. And we have our Tea Writers Union, which is really focused on transportation justice. Um, we're mostly focused on bus riders and making sure that people who are transit dependent have access to the transportation that they need to get to school or doctor's appointments or work or whatever it is um, that they need. So our, our basic model is that it's people who are most directly affected who are at the forefront and leading every single campaign that we have. And again, we try to involve a legal strategy if that's appropriate for a campaign. And we also try to bring in um, engineers or environmental health scientists or other public health practitioners depending on whether it's appropriate. So I want to give four um, examples of the campaigns where we've used this approach and we've had multiple people um, helping to, to win. And I will say, um, we're recruiting today at this event. If you are looking to do some environmental justice work or you think you might have some expertise that you could lend to a community, it doesn't matter if you live in Massachusetts or not, we think there's a way for you to be helpful. So um, this is just a, a short list of the kind of people we're looking for. If you are any of these, we'd love for you to register for our network and I've got forms on a table over there if you want to sign up. No obligation, but um, this is how you can find out about the volunteer opportunities that we have. So the first example, this is um, a campaign that's pretty near and dear to my heart. 
So uh, in the Chelsea, East Boston area, which is um, really close to Logan Airport, for those of you who maybe traveled from far away, um, if you came in by plane, you probably came to Logan, which is in East Boston. And there are train tracks where um, the you know, commuter rail trains and, and the subways travel. And we have uh, residents who live in those communities, um, one person in particular who tells the story that she can walk down the stairs of her stoop and put her arm out and her arm is over the train tracks. I mean, she is literally, I mean, lives adjacent to the train tracks and that's true of many people in that neighborhood. So there's a, an oil terminal that's in the community. There's actually multiple, but um, one company in particular was proposing to change the way it received its hazardous material. So they blend, the company blends gasoline and they get petroleum from ships and they get uh, ethanol, which is an additive, and they blend it together. So everything was arriving by ship to the facility, and the company wanted to switch to receive products by rail. And initially, people in the neighborhood saw, uh, we, we've learned at ACE, so um, people are assigned a job of reading the legal notices section of the local newspapers. And one of our East Boston residents saw this notice and she said, I don't know what this means, but there's this public hearing about some rail proposal. So it took us a long time to figure out whether people were supporting it, opposed to it, and people were very much opposed when we did our research. So we had helped from folks at Boston University, some people in this room, uh, and Tufts who were helping us think through what are the environmental health implications of transporting hazardous, incredibly flammable material on tracks where people live steps away. And um, I will say this th has become a much bigger issue. You might have heard of this in other places. Um, we were incredibly successful. We ultimately convinced the company to withdraw their proposal and we got two state laws passed in Massachusetts that address this particular issue. And um, there was a lot of really contentious uh, interactions between the community and the company. And since all of this has gone down, we actually approached all the oil terminals in the area and we asked to kind of sit down and do some relationship building. And we actually have a pretty decent relationship, I would say, going forward. So I, I don't think that this is never going to be proposed again, but I'd like to say that we've made some amazing progress in the last four years since this proposal happened. And this was absolutely communities directly imp impacted and affected at the forefront with support from me as an attorney and we brought in environmental health scientists who were um, doing some research on what is the impact of the foam that's needed to extinguish these ethanol train fires um, you know really really instrumental stuff and I should just say um, the the first law that we got passed um, was great and it sort of mandated a study on what are the impacts of doing this sort of rail transport of hazardous material. And then we had this second law proposed that would actually temporarily ban these trains from coming to this neighborhood of Massachusetts. And the day when the law was reported successfully out of both the Joint House and Senate Conference Committee, um, there was a huge derailment of a crude oil train in Lac Megantic, Quebec. So this image that you're seeing on the left um, it, literally the day that the uh, legislation got out. So it was pretty amazing. It was sort of, we were saying, hey, we were right. Like this can really be bad and it can happen. And there were uh, 47 deaths that occurred from this train accident. It was sort of the biggest in the last couple of years, but there's been many more. And then there was the recent Amtrak incident um, last week. So anyway, um, this was us uh, trespassing and violating the law, taking a picture on the rail tracks at the train station, um, which is very close to where a lot of the people live. So just to point that out. Another example of a campaign where it was residents taking the lead and we had support from the academic community is our youth program, REAP, has been advocating for a long time to address the diesel emissions issue in the city of Boston. So one of the things we learned a couple of years ago in Roxbury is that there was going to be a lot of construction happening. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the area, you are probably familiar with the renovated Ferdinand building, now Bruce Bowling building, um, the new police station. There's been a ton of construction projects. So the youth had decided years ago to try to get a diesel emissions reduction ordinance passed in the city of Boston. 
So we partnered with Tufts University, and they've got this uh, RV, this mobile vehicle that measures air pollution. So we looked at a couple of sites where demolition was happening, and they helped us measure whether uh, whatever the, the particle matters were in the air and compared that to sort of the levels that we would expect to find on days when construction wasn't happening. And they helped us show that there was a significant increase in fine particulate matter and ultra-fine particles when construction was happening as compared with when there is no construction on those days. So what that means is that particle pollution, as many of you know, has a lot of negative environmental health impacts. And um, if we were to track as much of that particle pollution as possible when construction is going on that we could make a significant improvement in air quality. So I've been talking about this for five years and finally the Boston City Council voted unanimously in support of the ordinance and we're waiting for uh, Boston Mayor Walsh to sign the thing. So I'm hoping to invite all of you to come to a signing ceremony in the next few weeks to support this um, very soon to be victory. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, this is, I don't know, I have so many favorites I could talk about, but this is, um, you know, awesome. So the, the folks at ACE realized a long time ago that we wanted to make sure that environmental justice was something that was just more than a piece of paper because in Massachusetts in 2002, we got a state EJ policy, which didn't really help any of the groups that we were working with um, to do anything better or different on the ground. So we convened this group of people, um, mostly grassroots groups with support from our academic allies and our environmental organizational allies, and decided um, when former Governor Patrick was in office that he would probably be a pretty good friend and be willing to sign some sort of executive order on environmental justice. So we got one in November of last year. We're um, one of eight states in the entire country that has one, and I would venture to say that I think this is the most um, interesting and helpful order out of any of the states that have one. It is. It does have the force of law, and it's because of so many people, but also several of you in this room were instrumental in supporting and being part of the alliance to review countless iterations of this order, um, helping us convince people that this was the right thing to do. And um, just, you know, it's awesome. And thanks to some people who were pictured and more for all of your good work. So we're very excited. And we actually have a copy of the EJ executive order on the table and our fact sheet uh, if you want to learn more. And then finally, um, an EJ issue that is, uh, has been an issue for a very long time in Massachusetts and elsewhere is proposed fossil fuel power plants being proposed for neighborhoods where there is already a dense population of polluting facilities, people of color, low-income residents, and um, ACE has been supporting residents for eight years now in fighting a power plant in Brockton, Massachusetts, which is kind of southeast of here, about an hour. And uh, majority people of color, it's um, a lot of low-income families, and the site of the power plant is actually adjacent to a uh, mobile home community where a lot of our uh, campaign leaders live and have a lot of health issues. So. Um, we, we needed experts to testify in support of what the residents were saying. So Dr. John Levy, who is here today, was instrumental in testifying about the negative public health aspects of the power plant. And Dr. Danny Faber has testified about the environmental injustices that this power plant would provide. And um, while we just got a favorable decision out of the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, the power plan could potentially still move forward. So we're still fighting. We're still relying on our expert witnesses for the next phase. And I'm hopeful we can report back on a victory in the future, but uh, it's not won yet. Although these residents in Brockton can talk about environmental justice and public health in ways that they never even dreamed of when we started this. So there's been a lot of victories, um, smaller victories, even though the major one hasn't yet happened although there's been no shovel in the ground. So, you know, that's something. 
Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about is ACE partnered with the EJ League of Rhode Island for many years, um, between 2010 and now, uh, to form the New England Environmental Justice Forum. So it's just about bringing people together from around New England who care about this work. And one of the things that we decided to do is to figure out if there were ways to get researchers who cared about EJ to be supporting grassroots groups in their work. So um, with the help of Danny and others, we've started this New England EJ Research Network. And um, again, we need your help. Please, please sign up. We've got registration forms. And these are just some photos from some of our fun events that we've had together. Um, and I, actually, the one thing I should say is we, we decided that it was important to have principles for researchers who are working with community groups. And so I think that the principles are actually really great and something that all of you would appreciate seeing. So they're located at this website that's up here on the screen. And um, basically, we ask any researcher who's looking to partner with an EJ group to agree to those principles before agreeing to sort of sign up and, and join the partnership. And this is my contact information if you have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And for those of you who are interested, you can either see Stacy or I if you're interested in signing up becoming a member of the New England Environmental Justice Research Network. Um, please feel free. We have brochures and pamphlets available. So our final speaker is Penn Lowe. And he's lecturer and director of the Master of Public Policy Program and Community Practice at Tufts University's Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning. That is a mouthful, right? But um, it's a wonderful program, and they actually uh, turn a lot of people into movement circles, government agencies, and the nonprofit world. Um, from 1996 to 2009, he served in various roles, um, many too, too many to really mention. But including, he served as Executive Director of Alternatives for Community Environment, or ACE. Um, he has published broadly on environmental and social justice issues. He has served on the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council's Health and Research Subcommittee, the Massachusetts Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, the Massachusetts Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, and on the boards of the Environmental Support Center, the Environmental Leadership Program, New World Foundation, and Community Labor United. And that's just a few. He's in many ways the Superman of the EJ movement, so it's appropriate that he follows Stacy. Please welcome Ken Love. Thanks, Danny, and uh, thanks to all the folks who organized this and Phil for inviting me. Um, it really is a privilege to be here and follow uh, both ACE and the EJ League of Rhode Island. Um, I want to just say that one of the reasons that it, I find it very interesting to be here at this moment is now that I wear a university hat, um, I can talk a little bit about uh, what my efforts have been, it, have been at Tufts to try to create the kind of university partner that I always wanted when I was on the community side. Um, so what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is lay out just a couple of kind of frames for thinking about university community collaboration and then introduce what uh, has been emerging out of the work that I've been involved in in hopes that uh, we can push ourselves to the next level because there's a lot of amazing work, partnerships, uh, long-term, deep, impressive work that's been going on with folks in this room. Um, but I guess I want to start out by saying that, I guess I'm going to start out by where Steve left off, right, which is where we still have to address a lot of these power relationships uh, between universities and communities. And uh, I've always had trouble with the term research. I think for me, you know, when you go out in the community and you talk about research, a lot of people get the impression that folks, to be a researcher, you have to have the lab coat on and you know, uh, be somebody very different from folks who live in the neighborhood. And I know we all don't believe that, but I just, for me, I've always had that kind of problem getting uh, over that divide of what research sometimes means to people. And I think at, at root it comes down to this idea of what knowledge is, right? Who, uh, who has it? 
how is it produced, and who uses it. Universities make a big, big claim to the territory of knowledge. And I know not, uh, communities also do, and, and environmental justice and social justice movements have made a very large claim in this space as well, and I feel like we have to find ways for those to work together. And um, so, just wanted to say, you know, the university is ivory tower, tends to be one of the ways that people look at universities. This, of course, is not the mold that any of us are aspiring to, um, but certainly one that I think a lot of us recognize and still have to contend with, right? This is the idea that academics hold a privileged position in, on the truth, on uh, the creation of knowledge, right? Uh, the converse means then that uh, community and local knowledge is often devalued or uh, perhaps even uh, invisibilized. Um, I think the other thing to point out here is universities, because of this privileged position, Right. Also, as institutions are a part of a system that reinforces the status quo. Right. Many of us aren't in that role, and we aren't trying to be in that role. But universities, in general, right, are in many ways propping up uh, frameworks, policies, ways of understanding the world that are really supporting the one percent. And um, and we are trying to fight that from both within the university as well as from the community side. And, and I'm looking at a few nodding heads and seeing that people recognize this dynamic, so I'm not going to stick on that one too much longer. Universities research collaborator, I would say this is the category that a lot of the work that I've heard in this conference is really, you know, this is really where the state of the art is. And we have some of the best examples of that happening in this room. But this is about universities really providing that technical assistance, the kind of expert testimony Stacy was talking about, um, being able to document and validate the conditions that people know to exist in the community, uh, but doing that in a way that somehow has more legitimacy in policy making and decision making circles, um, which is very still very important in the fights that we actually do have, right? Um, there's still a role for uh, a lot of these research collaborators in framing and defining the problems, right? So even environmental justice as, as an issue from the very early days had academic allies that were saying environmental racism exists. It's a, it's a real phenomenon. And uh, without those folks, right, environmental justice movement wouldn't be where it is today. Um, policy analysis and recommendations, yet another area where um, a lot of university research has been put in the service of environmental justice communities. Just want to say where community-based participatory research right, uh, is, is somewhat of a gold standard in this area because um, to me it's still, this is really about trying to get towards those equitable relationships. Um, it, it, it really pays attention to who has decision-making power in the research process, where the resources go. Um, community is supposed to be involved in some manner in every step of the process, right, from defining the problem all the way to disseminating and evaluating uh, the project. So, so in a lot of ways, a lot of the work that folks in this room have done to promote this frame has been very, very important because there's, there are more resources in this area. It is seen as more academically legitimate. Uh, um, and within the academic uh, world, especially public health, has become, you know, come to be accepted in a way that I know wasn't true probably 15 years ago. Um, so, so that is a huge resource, and, and seeing what that's done to support the kinds of projects that both ACE and EJ League have done is is, is very impressive. Um, but I guess I want to say that you know, is this really? what we aspire to? Is that the highest level of what we can aspire to? And I would say that there's still an issue for me because it's still framed as research, right? Um, and even if we are understanding research in a very, very different way and who creates that is a much more inclusive model, um, I don't think it gets at what universities as a whole as political economic institutions actually do. Um, because uh, even universities like Tufts, like Northeastern, like Brown, um, you know, we, these universities also take up space. They are, they are part of cities, right? They are part of driving the political agenda in these places. They are making claims to being placemakers, right? So they, they actually play a much bigger role than just the research. Um, and I would say we often forget that universities also are about education. Right, so uh, what is the educational portion of the university mission doing in relationship to our communities, right? And how do we connect all of those together? Um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit now in the last few minutes I have 
about, I'm trying to, to, to push the envelope at Tufts through what I'm calling a co-learning model. I invite you all to critique that because uh, I'm not sure that's the right frame either, but it's an attempt to go further. Um, so universities, anchor institution has been a frame that's been introduced now for the last dozen or so years. Um, but the reason I like it is because it does talk about universities and foregrounds their role in place, in geographic space. Um, right? Anchor institutions are institutions that once established tend not to move. So especially in kind of this age of globalization, uh, you know, suggests that anchor institutions are very important to local economies um, and cities. And so our universities definitely count as, as those. Um, I put this picture up, which is one of the first things you see when you go to Tufts and say, I want to visit, right, and, and apply. Well, what do they show? They show a picture of campus in relationship to downtown Boston because it is important to Tufts that we are located in a Boston region, right? Even though the campus itself, the main campus is Somerville, Medford, the medical campus is uh, Boston, um, you know, it, it makes a claim uh, to being part of that space. Yet, if you read the mission and vision statement of Tufts University, it makes zero mention of local and regional. Everything is defined as we are going to, you know, produce transformational research and learning experiences for people on campus and to make a difference in the world, right? So reference points are campus, institution, and the globe. Um, you know, those of you who are at Northeastern, you know, Northeastern's gone through its own identity transformation over the last 20 years. It used to be seen as largely a local regional commuter school. Somehow that wasn't good enough, and now it's a research institution with global right, reach. Um, so so it's, an issue, it's an issue that um, is very, very present, particularly for research universities, to say what is their responsibility to place um, and the fact that they are anchored in geographic space. So uh, what it means to be anchored, if you take a look at the fuller mission of what universities do, right? so we really do have to take seriously this idea of teaching and students. What use is it for folks at Whittier Street Housing Development across the street from Northeastern, right? What, what relationship do they have? Do they, to those residents, see a potential for their children to go to Northeastern University, right? Um, I know Northeastern is doing a lot of stuff in relationship to that, but uh, you know, that's a question that can be asked, I think, of all of our universities. Just because you're located in proximity or in the same neighborhood as one of our institutions, do you really have access? Um, you know, our schools like to brag now about how elite we are, right? The big headlines now are, we rejected 95% of students who applied, which means we're the best, right? Um, so, but, but that's, you know, what kind of message does that send to folks in our region? We asked Tufts how many students come, undergrads now, we're talking about 4,000 students in the undergrad population, how many in the incoming class came from Somerville? Our Dean of uh, Undergraduate Student Affairs, was, who's a great guy and very, very committed to making you know, diversity real, uh, said, you know, uh, I don't think it's more than a handful, right? So you know, those kinds of disconnects are still very present for us. Research, which is what uh, a lot of you uh, have your main hat on here. Um, I just want to say this is really a shift, and, and I think it's a shift that's already been happening and pushed forward by many of you, that we're not just doing research on the communities or for the communities, but with the communities. And then finally, service, which for those of you who are in faculty roles, you know, teaching, research, service being the third pillar of what faculty are supposed to do, um, really it shouldn't just be defined as service to your institution or to your disciplinary field, but what is your service back to communities. Um, and so as an anchor institution, you can also start looking at the university as an employer, as an economic engine. In fact, universities are making a big claim to how much they do for the local economy as a way to uh, increase their uh, influence on decision making and, and get garnering public resources, right? Uh, as a land steward and developer, this is probably one of the areas where communities and universities have had the longest tensions and clashes. Um, over institutional expansion and who benefits from that expansion. Oftentimes, that expansion is at the expense of lower income communities of color. Um, but anchor institutions also, I think, make a claim to being civic leaders and placemakers. 
So just to say a, a few words about um, co-learning. You know, so I want to kind of, for, for me, I've been trying to erase the word research from what I've been doing and calling what is an integrated suite of activities that we do. It's all about co-learning, right? So research, if nothing else, is about learning. Teaching and education, if nothing else, is about learning. Everybody has something to learn. Everyone has something to contribute in a joint and collaborative learning process. Um, we're trying to figure out how do you do this in a way that's long term. Too much of what we do is dictated by uh, the academic schedule. So you know, we have, for instance, at, at Tufts in our department, we have those field projects program, wonderful, but limited to one semester. It's a very artificial bounds around you know, how do you get student teams to work on real projects with community partners when you're bound to a January start and uh, an April finish. Um, we're trying to figure out how do you actually value community partners for all the things that they do. So we rely in our department, we're a professional urban planning and public policy department, we rely on our community partners in not only helping us advance the research that we do, but also in teaching and preparing and guiding the professional development of our students. So they're in fact co-education uh, partners, they're in fact co-research partners, and uh, what we say is, what, we, what I say, and I'm trying to get other people to say, is that our community partners are co-producers right, of our mission at, at Tufts. Um, but we need to be thinking about you know, how do we join theory and practice in a way that we create knowledge that is usable, democratic, and makes a difference in the world. Right? If we start with that vantage point on what knowledge is and what we are trying to produce through our learning process, then uh, you know, that hopefully will, will mean that everyone sees a fundamental and critical role for themselves to play in that process. And then finally, one of the pieces that often is, is missing um, is the ability to recruit students into our universities, not just have them involved in some very interesting projects and take nice photos of everybody working together, but you know, can we get them that degree from our institution? Right? Can we, can we get them uh, to become part of our research teams in the long term uh, and, and further diversify our own fields? So um, let's see, let me, let me skip around a little bit and just say that I'm not going to go through too much about uh, the examples uh, because I do want to get to a page of just a few questions that I want to leave you all with. But I do want to say that uh, we've been doing a lot of deep partnership-based work over many years at UEP, which has been in existence now for 40 plus years. If you look at some of our partners, we've worked with some of our partners now for, for three decades. Right? We've had multiple field projects, internships, you know, uh, collaborative research projects over that time period. How often have we ever sat down and tried to plan out an actual partnership that lasted more than a year or two years? Right. Um, I would say actually never. We just happened to do this because students were interested, faculty were interested, we're each trying to drive this agenda, but institutionally we're still falling very, very short. Right? We're not capturing the real synergies of longer term partnership. Um, long term, I'm trying to introduce the idea that three years is the next step to go. Long term, you know, in, in reality, is, it should be more like a decades long strategy. Um, but for instance, just to give you one short example, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is located and has been a longtime partner of ACE just about a mile from here. Uh, we've had multiple field projects with them. Some of our graduates have gone on to become uh, organizers in that organization for, for more than a decade. Uh, one of their recent um, executive directors, John Barros, is finishing his mid-career master's program at ACE. Their new executive director, Juan Layton, is one of our mid-career master's uh, alumni from about five years ago. And so we've had this kind of revolving door relationship with the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. And we're trying to introduce now these three-year partnerships that we're calling co-research, co-education, core for short. Um, and DS and I will be one of our first partners in that so that we can really plan for all the different ways that we can be partnering together um, and ensuring that the, the role that the partners are playing is adequately valued and particularly because a lot of our partners are low, well, nonprofits that don't have as much resources as universities. Um, we really need to make sure that you know, if we see them as equal partners, you know, how much are we willing to pay, I'm talking to the university folks in the room, when we bring in a visiting lecturer for a semester, right? 
You know, what does that number look like? And then why is it that when we think about community partners playing a similar role, we think, oh, they should just come to the table for free because they're getting all of our students. They're getting, you know, all this free research, right? But uh, so while that may be true, um, they're getting a lot of value. Um, they're also really spending a lot of staff time, right? I mean, Stacy's uh, supervised a number of students I've sent her way, and I'm sure folks at the Rhode Island League have similar experiences working with young people in, uh, from the universities you work with. So, um, so that's the, the, the model that we're trying to work towards is, uh, is to have that longer-term model. There are some, some very serious challenges to this model, of course. And the first one is how do we adequately value the co-production? Um, that's been my toughest battle at Tufts, which is, you know, I've had one dean say to me, what, you want to pay the community partners? You know, we can't do that. Um, and, uh, you know, even though we actually are doing it in other parts of the university, and many of you do it through your research projects, uh, how do we work across difference and really pursue interculturalism, right? I mean, all those kind of racial, socioeconomic differences and divides um, that still exist between elite universities and communities, right? If we collaborate closely, we're going to have to really figure out a lot of these uh, working across difference. Um, on the university side, there's a whole battle to be fought, which is how do you get this to be adequately recognized and rewarded from within the university? Those of you who have had to go through tenure or are pursuing tenure know all too well you know, the pressures um, and the constraints of that process. And, uh, and finally, I think this is a challenge just to universities and their identities. Um, you know, how do we get universities who, you know, I'm not under any illusion that we're going to shift our institutions to say we're going to become totally local and place-based, but how do we get them to broaden their framework so that they understand that to be globally excellent, you need to be also locally anchored. And, um, and that a lot of value can be produced out of that local anchoring. All right, so let me stop there, and uh, thank you all for inviting us.